Good morning. Tell me about your life, your past and your family, your schooling, um, where your introduction to writing and art came from, and then we'll go to how your relationship with Don added to that. But tell me where you started, where you came from, where all this came from, where did all this come from? Hard to tell. I think it's inside me and it was struggling to come out from a young age. I was very fortunate in my childhood years. We had a nice backyard and I was pretty much let out the back door and allowed to do whatever I wanted to. So I think my earliest memories are on sitting on a swing and singing mm -hmm. and really interacting with the natural world. Um, I didn't have a lot of friends, I didn't have a lot of peers. What I had was nature, even in small amounts, um, and that was the most meaningful part. I had really incredible parents in that they really made their own lives. They made it work. They supported themselves. They supported us. They provided all of our education. So we were not terribly insecure growing up. And they didn't have a habit of telling us no. If, if we couldn't have something, they would say, show us a way that you can do this responsibly. And then we'll see. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't throw the whole family out of balance and it wasn't a temper tantrum and you honestly came up with a responsible way to achieve what you wished, you were allowed to go forward. And so from a very young age, you know, it was okay, some, you want something that costs money, you want a toy and we're not going to buy right. it for you, but we'll give you chores to let you earn the way or you can get chores from the neighbors, you can earn the way. So the door was never slammed shut. We were always given a way to think or move, and if we weren't responsible enough yet, it came back and they'd say, sorry, you're not responsible enough to have a pet. If you can't feed an animal or you can't pay for the care of it, you, you don't have a pet. Right. When it came to starting school, I hated it. I'll be blunt, I'm not a joiner. The idea of doing everything in unison because everybody else was doing it absolutely went against this little <laughs> wild barefoot freedom running around the backyard. Mm -hmm. I did grow up in a family with two older brothers, two younger sisters. I was not alone. So I did have to make do around others, but more often trying to work an individual, a very individual person with a very very keen sense of where I wanted to go. I had to learn to work around the people as opposed to with them. So right. school became prison, effectively. And I learned really early that my imagination had no boundaries. And I think the biggest jolt for me came early on in school when I brought home my first report card. And my mother sat me down, and we looked at the grades. And I had top grades except for attentiveness. And I had failed. And in the margin, the teacher had scrawled daydreams constant. <laughs> and I had to look at my mother and say, what's that? And that was a rather rude kick. It was an awakening because up until that time, I had never differentiated mm -hmm. the world everybody else could perceive and the world I could perceive. Um, the two had no boundaries. So right. I walked back and forth at will and suddenly here I am in school and whether I'm a good girl or not, depends on whether I can tell if it's inside of my head or outside of my head. Mm -hmm. I had to learn fast and it made me really, really, really introverted. Right. I was afraid to open my mouth because the wrong thing might come out. Um, my parents read stories to us. I had a vocabulary that was way ahead. And so this incomprehensibility of I had lived in one kind of world and it shattered took me years to refit that back together. And I think finally, after college, after my 20s, I threw it all out and said, you know, there was something basic here that I had and it's key to my happiness. And while I'm still wrestling with the dichotomy of what I could imagine and where the world is and, and where things rub and where the friction and the sparks come off, I think a lot of my creativity springs out of that. Um, I know that I set out in college to be a scientist. This may shock some people. Um, I took a lot of astronomy, a lot of microbiology, a lot of biology, a lot of marine biology. I, I really seriously thought, until I realized that the boxes that they draw around science are so rigid. And I can just tell you a little anecdote. Of, in college, I was paid to run the telescope at night. And when the students wanted the telescope pointed to something, then I would get the coordinates and bring the object into the view. Uh -huh. And I'd be standing there with two or three 
professors, two professors, and maybe an assistant professor, two, you know, PhDs. These were serious people. They were going to Arecibo and using the radio telescopes. They were, they were in the research. Right. And I'd see stuff, and I'd go, what's that? And they'd go, we don't know. And I'd say, aren't you even curious? Doesn't that even make yeah. you wonder? And, and I realized that they could never write a paper about that yeah. or pursue that because they would have been laughing stock. Yeah. So too many of the things that I saw in my world did not fit. So if, if I had to sum up, I break out of boxes because I can't stand the thought of limitations. And I know I have them. I run into them as a human being all the time. But I'm constantly driven to push those envelopes and say, yeah, but what if some belief is stopping us? Or what if there's a better way? Or what if there's something we haven't even imagined yet? Right. Or what if there's an area we haven't explored yet or an idea we were just too scared to look at? And sometimes looking at the scary ideas, you get the good ideas. And looking at the good idea, you end up in the scary idea. But the idea that we're given an unbounded imagination. And I seem to have always been pushed, whether it was approved of or not, to use that. Interesting. So if that gives you an idea, you know, as far as my parents, as I got into my older right. years, I did pay for my own horses because they didn't say, no, we got to educate all these kids for college. You can't, we can't afford it. Right. That's what my peers were told. I was told, show us a way. Hmm. And I did. I had my own horses. And paid for them and earned the money and they helped me if I fell down and ran out right. accidentally but the idea that there were no closed doors was really a wise thing the best thing they gave me my father was there's no problem you can't solve if you break it down into little steps you'll get there okay. the mistake is looking at the mountain and thinking you can do that in one step you can't yeah no I so he said let the problem solve itself but yeah. take the step you can take today Okay. Um, from your, you know, like your perspective, how did you meet Don? Where did Don come into the picture? And how did that fit into your world? I met Don in front of the painting called The Second Drowning, which is a very famous work of his. He won a silver medal at Society of Illustrators for it, and it's an awesome piece. We were in an art show, we both had work up, and I had seen his name. And I saw the name tag, I knew who he was. And I immediately said I was awestruck by the painting, I was awestruck by the work. Uh -huh. And it was right into his deaf ear. <laughs> First thing he did was walk away, he didn't hear. Um, at the time, I was in my late 20s. And again, not fitting. I had seen Howard Pyle's painting and drawing, um, knew that I wanted to combine stories an illustration. I had ditched science because of the box. I had decided it's going to be writing and illustrating because I have too many interests. I just can't stand to specialize. As Buckminster Fuller said, only right. insects specialize. We're human beings. We don't have to. So I was trying to break 60 or 70 different boxes, figuring if I write and illustrate, I can put anything I want to in the box and out will come something incredible. So really, whatever I choose to do in life will always find a place. I can still express it. So that was my choice to write and illustrate. Um, I was extremely active outdoors. I was doing camping, I was doing offshore sailing, I was doing day sailing and teaching sailing. I was working with competition horses and teaching that and training. Very outdoor oriented. Um, when you spend all day inside doing introspective things, the best thing to do is get outside and do something physical. And I've never given that up. But I found dating wise that was a horrible incompatibility. Um, the people who want to do the outdoor physical stuff just didn't want to get into the intellectual. The dates who wanted to go outdoors all the time um, couldn't stand me painting and writing. For the, and the ones who were just totally indoor people, I was just completely frustrated. It seemed like every time I went out with somebody, all they wanted to do was make me into something they wanted. They wanted and there was no room for creativity. That was the first thing that was going to go. or. It had to be when they were gone. Oh, you can do that anything you want, but when I'm here, you have to drop it. And I'm going, I don't like limitations. I hate boundaries, and I hate being told you can't. 